Look, this guy comes running at you, hangry, at full speed. What are you doing? Well, Pekka was a zero usage little guy that has some not great stats, but it's 95 attack and 97 speed. Give it a little something to work with. Its unique electric dark typing is solid offensively, and its exclusive ability Hunger Switch can make it super fun. This allows it to switch between full belly and hangry mode at the end of each turn, making it alternate between electric and dark type. This pairs with its signature move Aura Wheel, which is a strong 110 power electric move when in full belly, and dark type when in hangry mode. This comes with a plus one speed boost, which gets more P.E.K.K.A. running super fast, and it can also use Stab Knockoff, Rapid Spin for some hazard removal, and even Parting Shot to weaken some offenses in Bale. More P.E.K.K.A. or more Pico is a gimmicky little fella, but it can absolutely be better than people think. Look, the fact of the matter is, Morpeko is the greatest Pokemon of all time. It's a hamster that goes into hangry mode. He's hilarious, and this thing does not get enough love. So today, it's finally time to see what peak performance looks like, whether you like it or not. Now, if you're into that kind of thing, you should consider hitting that subscribe button. I'm on my way to 400k, and I'd love to have you as part of the journey. Now with that, let's go ahead and jump into the battle. All right, so my opponent is gonna go ahead and lead off with the Espeon. Now, I decided to toss out the Lycanroc. I was kind of expecting maybe you know, a different lead and then a swap into Espeon, expecting the Stealth Rock to try to magic bounce him. But now I find myself in a position where, yep, I should probably go ahead and get out of here with the uh, the Rock Dog Boy. So, I decided this feels like a pretty good time to bring in the uh, Thickle Bulla Oatmeal, the uh, Clefable. Now, they decided to go for the turn one Combine, which does make Espeon pretty scary. However, I know that I can take attacks from this thing all day long because Clefable does not die. And also, we do not care how, how calm Buddy's mind is over here because I'm actually a physical attacker, so I can go for a Choice Banded Adamant Knockoff as they're going to take this opportunity to Psychic Noise. Now, it does prevent me from healing, which obviously doesn't matter, but it is also going to now pop the Throat Spray, which is going to give it a second special attack boost. And Espeon would be scary, except I tell him to knock it off. And with a choice ban, even without having an item, that actually kills Espeon, which is hilarious. And honestly, I'm finding so much value out of physical Clefable that uh, nobody expects to, to take a knockoff and at least expect to that much damage. So, Espeon is now using that Throat Spray boost in Hell, and this draws in a quite a big threat. The old Triangle Moth comes in, we're gonna go ahead and pretend like those are triangles and not diamonds, and I am a little bit afraid here, because obviously, this thing has the coverage, it now has a special attack boost because of that quark drive, and I decide to switch into the Porygon 2. So I'm working with the uh, Eviolite special defensive Porygon 2, just for situations like this. I can come in on sludge waves all day, and I do kind of want to neutralize this bad boy a little bit by going for a thunder wave. So. They actually are going to go for the Fiery Dance now. It is going to do a little bit of a chunk, but I, of course, miss my damn Thunder Wave. It's always a situation when you would love for a Thunder Wave to hit that it's going to miss for you. So they do, they realize they're probably not going to be able to grab a kill here, and they don't want that thing to be paralyzed. And as they do switch out, it's good news because they used up their booster energy, but now I am face to face with a damn Grizzly Bear. I trace his guts, and this thing is going to be eating my guts now if I don't get my ass out of here, because as I go for that Thunder Wave, it, of course, does not affect it, and also now it does give it that Guts boost with that Flame Orb. So, this thing is quite scary, and at this point I kind of am like, alright, well something is going to take some big old damage here. And I decide, since they actually didn't have the opportunity to set up the hazards of their own, I can actually go into Lycanroc here. The reason for that is because I am Focus Sashed, and I know that I should be faster here. So, funny part is they go for a Trailblaze, which does give it a speed boost, but Ursaluna is a fat fella. It's not going to be running very quick even with a plus one to speed. So I can take this opportunity to actually click Endeavor knowing that I'm going to be faster still. So uh, they are likely worried about a close combat. They're like, you know what, this thing does have coverage with the ability to punch his normal type ass. So they are going to go ahead and commit the Terror. They're going to go Terra Fairy, uh, trying to take a resisted hit from a close combat. And then after a second Trailblaze, I am in danger. However, what they do not know is I instead am going to click the Endeavor, which brings them down to my 6 HP, which is absolutely amazing. Not only because now we're going to be able to allow the Ur Ursulina to burn itself to death, but also they committed the Terra, and now I don't have to worry about it. So that is super clutch. Honestly, that lead Lycanroc is super useful in terms of... Uh, just being able to catch people off guard with you know, going for getting knocked down to Focus Sash, going for Endeavors, and then have the priority Accelerock. And while we weren't able to set up Stealth Rock here, I'm willing to make that trade 
because that thing is extremely scary and uh, no sea bears for me today. I have drawn my my circle in the sand. So, on the empty battlefield, I decide to go into the Morpeko. I'm thinking, you know what, Morpeko is in a pretty decent spot to be able to potentially parting shot some stuff. And they actually go into the Shaman. So, Shaman Sky, or Skyman, is actually going to go for the Air Slash here over the threat of the Seed Flare. And uh, I'm able to take it nicely, obviously resisted, and that allows me to then go for the Aura Wheel. So, Electric-type Aura Wheel now turns me into Hangry Mode, and you will not like me when I am Hangry, because I got that Speed Boost. I'm going to run on the wheel once again. This time it's dark. And uh, Shaman's going to absolutely go down there. So they likely expected a switch while they go for the air slash there. But sometimes you got to just let the hamster do its thing, man. This thing is an absolute beast. And uh, with a little bit of bite of a random little circle thing, we now are back to normal and we're feeling good. It turns out a little bit of a, a little bite to eat goes a long way. And that is a lesson I have learned. And uh, so I know I'm at plus two speed. They decide to go into the Dragapult here, probably thinking, all right, this thing's electric type. Currently, it cannot go for a dark type aura wheel, but that is where Homeboy would be mistaken. They literally have a dragon that's got jets fast as hell, but you know what you're not faster than? Just a little guy that's been running on a wheel a couple times. I decide to go for the Terra Dark, just because I want to ensure a knockoff kill here. I'm able to outspeed, and uh, with that Dark Terra, that is going to be a dead Dragapult with the ghostly tail and everything. And Morpeko is absolutely doing it to him. All you need sometimes is just a little bit of speed. And then its ability to be able to kind of pivot out with parting shots. This thing, rapid spin, getting rid of hazards while boosting speed, is a freaking monster. So, they're now down to two Pokemon left. And as they go into the crazy-ass futuristic moth, they cannot handle the threat of the hamster. And that was an, they, they said they're going to spare the rest of their squad here. So... We had the game in pretty much a win condition, and Buddy decides to just let it happen. And that is the true power of our friend Morpeko. So, Morpeko, Morpeko, I think it's Peko? I don't know. Regardless, that's going to bring us into game number two, because the little fake-ass Pikachu hamster is not done yet. So, this time we have quite an interesting matchup. We do have a team switch, and one thing remains the same. Morpeko is here to do two things. Chew bubblegum, run on hamster wheels... I guess, I guess three things, and, and kick some ass. We're all out of bubblegum, moral of the story is we're gonna kick some ass, and run on some hamster wheels, let's get into it. So, this time my opponent's actually gonna lead off with the superior, not the kind of guy you're expecting to see as a lead, but it is kind of scary, and as I lead off with the cleaver, I got the cleavage just right from the start, this is not the greatest matchup for me, and I'm thinking I would love to just go, I mean, it, it's a fine matchup for me, but as I wanna try to set up my stone axe, Stealth Rock, I decide instead I'm actually just going to switch. I'm going to go for that U-turn, which I kind of expected to maybe grab a kill there. It turns out it does not. And that is kind of unfortunate because now I, Superior does one thing. And that is throw Leaf Storms out and get contrary boosts and then just be scary. So I decide to switch into the Gardevoir, who you know is naturally especially defensive. I know that I can take an attack here and then try to get something going. Turns out they actually miss, which is fantastic. And... As I'm looking at this, I'm like, surely they know that they're not going to be able to grab a kill here, and maybe they don't waste the superior. So as they do go for the Leaf Storm here, it does connect, and actually does a big old chunk of damage. And it turns out they actually stay in. So my teleport was essentially just to predict the switch. It would allow me to see what they want to switch into, and then I can choose a matchup. But instead, I just come in, take a Leaf Storm, and then dip. And now I have to figure out what I want to go into. So here's the good news. Good news is we have seen that this thing is actually Life Orb, and... It's actually also in range to be knocked out from its own life orb after one more hit. So, you know, knowing that I'm not going to be slaughtered to death by the freaking contrary superior, I decided to go into the Boom Bat. Now, Noivern is in a spot where I know that I can outspeed, and I'm going to take this opportunity to set up the Tailwind. Kind of a little bit of an in interesting play here. This team is basically built around trying to get a lot of momentum in terms of being able to bring in, you know, Flareon safely. So, as I'm able to go for that Tailwind, it uh, does just knock me out with that Leaf Storm. But now the Tailwind is on our end, on our end and uh, the winds are blowing out here. So we're going to be feeling pretty fast. And uh, as I do, in fact, go down there to the plus two Leaf Storm, I'm down a couple boys. But now Flareon is out here in basically full form. Because as I bring this thing in, they actually decide to go into the Gardevoir. And, uh, you know, as I have decent special bulk, I know that I can take an attack from this thing. And um, I need one turn to get my guts, essentially. 
So, as I do have the Tailwind on my side for quite a few more turns, I decide to go for a Flame Charge here. That's going to be a little bit of insurance, give me a speed boost for when that is going to wear off. And now I'm going to be faster than everything, except for the fact that they go for a Trick Room. And that throws a big old wrench right in my damn plans, because now... That just flips the script a bit, and now everything's going to be faster than me until the freaking trick room wears off. And I'm like, well, that makes things interesting. Now, at least I know that I can still take an attack from this thing. They just go for a Draining Kiss, which is likely probably going to be their only attacking move if they don't have, you know, Psychic coverage. But I obviously eat the Kiss up easily, and then I can just kill this thing with a Facade. The problem is, whatever they want to go into is just going to be faster. And little Flareon is having a tough time. It's kind of a hilarious dynamic in terms of having Tailwind and Speed Boost on my side when the Trick Room's up. And uh, we are in danger. So, they can switch into whatever they like. Turns out they're going to go Bronzong. And I'm feeling like, is this a freaking offensive Bronzong under Trick Room? I'm kind of afraid because Buddy's low-key cooking here. So, at least what I do know is I have the coverage on, obviously, a Flare Blitz. And I'm just going to click it. I feel like I can live anything this wants to throw at me. And actually, it's going to take this opportunity to go for that fast Stealth Rock, which does outspeed me. Except now, I'm able to uh, definitely get off a nice little blitz on him, and I'm thinking maybe that kills. It actually lives. I'm like, is this a freaking heat-proof Bronzong? What's happening here? It's gotta be, because now it actually activates a weakness policy, and now Bronzong is scarier than I've ever seen a Bronzong before, and I'm like, what? <laughs> this is wild. So, I obviously am not doing too hot over here in terms of poison damage, and my Tailwind goes away, which obviously doesn't really matter. However, at this point, they have two turns of Trick Room left, and uh, I decide it's kind of in my best interest to just kind of let the Flareon go down here. Kind of seeing what they're working with in terms of the team now. I'm probably not going to be able to get too much going. And I'm like, yeah, I just kind of want to see what this freaking bell wants to do to me. They go for the Shadow Ball and it uh, comes straight out of the damn forehead and that does kill the Flareon. So, weakness policy, Bronzong does have one turn left of the Trick Room. And uh, that makes things kind of a little bit crazy here. So... I have the option to revenge switch into whatever I like, of course. I decide I don't have great options, really. I'm just going to go into the more Peko here, and I don't really know what kinds of coverage this thing is working with. It is going to be faster, however, and if it's just Shadow Ball and maybe a Psychic move, I probably can obviously live one. So I'm just going to go for an Aura Wheel as they actually set up the Psychic Terrain. So dude is absolutely cooking with a damn kitchen fire over here. They got Trick Room, Psychic Terrain. And I'm just going to go ahead and catch some cardio on the old hamster wheel, which is good because not only does it take care of the Bronzong, which was weird, but also now I'm at plus one speed and the Trick Room goes away. So we know that the Peko is going to be faster than whatever they got. And the good thing about the Psychic Terrain is that now it's going to block priority. So as they do have things like an Infernape in the back, it's not going to be able to mock Punch, which is honestly pretty good. So we put on our Hangry outfit and they decide to go into the Uxie here. So young Lemonhead... Coming in, and on that Psychic Terrain, I imagine it's probably like an expanding force. It obviously can't go for it on my Dark-type ass, but I'm kind of just like, you know what? I'm just going to I'm just gonna go for another Aura Wheel here. And to boost damage even further, I know that Uxie can be pretty defensive, but it would be sweet if I could get the Pico, more Peko, to take care of it. So I'm actually just going to go for the Terra Dark, and that makes things interesting. Obviously, with the Hunger Switch ability, just now, essentially, I'm not going to switch, and I'll just stay full Dark. Which can come back to bite you if I do it on a turn where I stayed dark, just because now I'm not going to have an electric aura wheel. But I can go for that dark one, and that's just going to straight up take care of the guy. I feel like one of the fun parts about more Peko, people just underestimate the little guy, and that's exactly what we're looking for. Especially, it kind of has just a weird speed tier. You start to get some boosts from rapid spins and aura wheels in the mix. People get confused on what turns you're looking at on like hunger switch and stuff. It's a fun time. So. Now they decide to bring in the Infernape, and while we're in a decent spot knowing that they can't Mach Punch because of the Psychic Terrain, it also... I, I can't knock this thing out with my Dark Stab. So, I'm just gonna go for the Parting Shot, knowing that I'm gonna be faster, and that's what Morpeka does best, bro. He comes in, he does a little bit of damage, and then is fast enough to just Parting Shot, and then makes it a whole lot easier uh, to get momentum on our side switching in. So, it's pretty likely they go for the close combat here, and if they want to overheat, Disco Ball is going to have a bad time. But we've been kind of conserving the Weezing, knowing that I can just physically wall the fella, and it is Disco time, baby. I bring in the Weezing here, and uh, of course we take a little bit of Stealth Rock Chip, but they are just going to close combat. Right to the ball is going to hurt a little bit, obviously, not really, but uh, now it's going to drop the Spadef. Got to make it a whole lot easier for Sludge Bombs to do stuff, and again, as long as this is not a mixed Infernape, Hey, Weezing should have an easy time here. So I'm just going to be able to uh, go for some Sludge Bombs here. They're down to two Mons left. 
And at this point, they're actually going to go for the taunts. And I pretty much have no reason not to attack here. I can't Will-O-Wisp the guy anyway. We fall for the taunt, but Weezing's like, I'm a freaking sweeper anyway, bro. I go for that sludge bomb. It actually does live easily. But again, after some black sludge recovery, there's pretty much no way that the ape can come out on top here. So we continue to go for the sludge bombs. And they're actually going to dip out as well. The hamster has been scaring people today. And I'm convinced that it was, it was, it was on the hamster. Phanamon was going to be the Dusclops. But the Pico handles that. And if you thought we were done, you are mistaken. I do have one more bonus battle for you guys. This is a good time for me to ask. If you've been enjoying the video, make sure to hit that like button. If you've made it this far in, you might as well click the button anyway. YouTube enjoys it, and it definitely it helps out the channel. So, let's go ahead and get into it. Alright, so this time, homie's gonna go ahead and lead off with the Claude Sire. Buddy's looking bulbous and ready to party, as I, of course, have the Lycan Rock. So... I imagine Claude Sire Lee just kind of here to set up the Stealth Rock and just do some Claude Sire nonsense. I'm just going to set up the rocks of my own, as you pretty much know, the Lycan Rock drill at this point. I got my Focus Sash ready for an Earthquake. However, they actually end up going for the Toxic, which that ends up being kind of the best possible play on their end because it's going to break my Focus Sash, and Lycan Rock is definitely not as reliable without it. So, being poisoned to take a little bit of chip, Sash is gone, and I don't really have much I can do to the Claude Sire if I can't Endeavor. So, I decide I should probably switch out here. Now, I'm thinking, surely they either go for a Stealth Rock this turn, or they might Earthquake. So, I decide to go into the Hydreigon, who, while there's always the risk of this being an unaware Claude Sire, I can potentially start to set up some Dragon Dances in this thing's face. And, uh, most of the time, they're just gonna be Water Absorbed. So, I also have the coverage with Earthquake, and I'm thinking, hey, hold on a second, Tripod Dragon might be able to go a little bit crazy here. Regardless, I'm gonna go for that Dragon Dance just to see what they wanna do here. If they switch, I can always just swap out and then just save the setup for later. So, I do go for that Dragon Dance here, which is amazing. Not a lot of people expecting that physical attacker, of course. And they're just gonna stay in and go for the Toxic. So, being Toxic is fine. This thing is kinda just here to set up, break some holes in teams. And if it doesn't last super long, it's totally fine. So, we're gonna start to rack up some Poison Damage. A freaking third of the squad out here poisoned from this damn Claude Sire. And at this point, I'm just going to go for that Earthquake. And uh, they do actually stay in because they're probably maybe thinking they can take attacks. I do have that coverage with the Earthquake, and that just takes care of the Claudie boy. But he is a full-on clump, and we love the guy. Looking like Mr. Hanky out here. So, I'm sitting at plus one, both attack and speed. And I still have the Terra in the back pocket. So, I know that they do have the Fairy in the form of the Primarina. So... They're going to switch directly into that, of course, as kind of their best check to this. And I'm like, you know what? Should I not waste this setup? I feel like, here's the thing. I can go for a Steel Terra expecting something like a Moonblast. I can then set up another Dragon Dance, and then I'm looking pretty close to being able to grab a kill here. So, I am going to commit that Terra. I'm going to go for that Terra Steel, just thinking that uh, depending on what this thing's built with, I should be able to take uh, an attack pretty easily, and then still have a few turns left in me, depending on you know, kind of what we're working with. So... We have got the menacing axe on my head. I will no longer be taking four times weakness to fairy. And I'm going to just dance in this thing's face for a nice little free show once again. I uh, probably am looking like Earthquake is going to be my best damage. And at plus two, it's not quite going to be able to kill here. But as they go for the Moonblast, it actually ends up getting a crit. Which is going to do way more than we expected it to. And that is not great. Because now as the poison knocks me down, I just die to my next one. So I got a little bit... Got a little bit crazy there with the Terra, and it doesn't end up working out for me. Now, they even actually have the priority with the Aqua Jet, which is crazy. Um, and as I go for the Earthquake, it also doesn't even end up quite killing. So, I have let the Hydreigon down, and also, as I go down, I lose my Terra. So, not the greatest turn of events, but we did take care of, care of the Claude Sire. Got this thing into range where it's easy to just pick off at this point. And it's kind of also nice because it also it opens the door for the more Pekka to come in here. And I have a nice little spot to do exactly what I want to do. So, uh, this thing is in range to where a Rapid Spin will kill it. I am faster barring an Aqua Jet, but Aqua Jet won't be enough to knock me out regardless. Uh, so, I can just go for a Rapid Spin here. Not only be able to grab the kill, but also get those damn Stealth Rocks out of here. And uh, we just, this is what this boy does. We come out here, we spin it on our wheel, having a nice little time. Uh, and that, I guess there wasn't really a wheel there, but you, you get the idea. Down goes the Primarina. And now we're sitting at uh, a pretty nice position here with the Morpeko being able to have that plus one speed. I should be really fast to deal with pretty much anything. And as I go into Hangry Mode, we're full Dark type. So, they decide to bring in the Serra Ledge. Now, this thing does come in, uh, gets that potential Sash broken by the, uh, the Stealth Rock there, which is great. And I pretty much have no reason not to just go for an Aura Wheel here. We got the Dark type one on the turn we needed it. And it is actually just going to straight up knock out the dude. Uh, again, the hamster has been disrespected 
and uh, nobody nobody expects this thing to do what it can do. So that takes out care, takes care of the Sarah Ledge. I don't know if they expected the Focus Ash or if they forgot about the Stealth Rock. Uh, regardless, nobody knows what the freaking Morpico is going to even do. So that is perfect. So now as they go into the Corvette, I'm thinking, hold on, does Buddy not know how this hamster works? Because as I go back into base form, now I have an electric type aura wheel, and I'm like, well, I can just go ahead and eat this Corviknight for breakfast. However, as they switch in, they just immediately switch out. They're probably like, oh shit, I think I fucked up there, because now he's back to electric. And they're just going to switch into the Kama O here, which is extremely scary. So, obviously this thing can live in aura wheel, at least the electric one. It's going to do a nice little bit of a chunk, and gives me another speed boost. So, while I am faster, and... This is kind of a matchup that Morpeko does try to switch into a lot of the time if they're going to go for a Clangorous Soul. Because listen, I'm Mirror Herb, so I'm like trying to copy stat boost, but it's not worth the risk. If they just attack here, uh, I go down and I know that I can't kill this thing. Both of my, actually both of my types are not very effective here, but I just decided to go for the Parting Shot. That's just going to make things a whole lot easier. If this thing does set up, it's not going to be um, as crazy to deal with, and that's just going to go ahead and drop the offenses there. So... Uh, the reason why I don't stay in there is just because I know I have the insurance with the Clefable. As they go for the clinging scales, works out perfectly. My fairy type ass piece of chewed gum obviously switches in easy. And then I'm thinking I probably imagine they switch out here and I want to go for the knockoff. But they actually stay in instead and they're going to go for the Terra to just get rid of that fairy weakness. And most of the time, Kamo is going to be working with setup in the form of like a throat spray and a boom burst, and that's probably what they're going to do because they go Terra normal. So this thing now gets some uh, normal stab, but they do also have the flash cannon coverage. But Chewed Gum is an absolute beast, able to take less than half from that from a max HP Clefable, and I'm able to actually knock off that throat spray. So before he's able to use that spray, Buddy's throat is going to be is going to be sore as hell without that. So. Uh, bad news about going for the knockoff and them not switching out is that now I'm stuck into that with my choice band and I've kind of been forced to get out of here. So I decide now to switch back into the more Peko. Seeing the damage on Clefable, I'm thinking maybe there's a chance I can live uh, if they go for the flash cannon here. But instead, they actually boom burst. And even with the Terra stab, I actually live, which is kind of surprising. It likely tells me this thing is not max special attack and running likely just some more bulk, just kind of expecting to get that special attack boost. And that works out pretty nice, because Hamster's not really used to living stuff, and now I know that I'm faster because this thing hasn't set up. And I can finish it off with an Aura Wheel, not only that, but get my speed boost. And we're just hanging on by a damn thread out here. And down goes the Kama, oh, their scariest setup sweeper, along with that Terra as well. So, Morpeko once again find him, finds him, his little hungry ass in a pretty good spot here. We are in fact hangry, except now we're feeling good. I love the, the switch is hilarious. The animation is super funny. So... Now they can switch into whatever they like on a Revenge, and they're running pretty low on options. However, they do have this ugly asshole that freaking, yeah. <laughs> the fake ass Amoongus. This thing comes in with his weird curtains on his head. I don't know what his deal is, but he does have the Protosynthesis, and it does give it an attack boost. So, I obviously cannot really attack here, and I'm afraid of a Sucker Punch, so I just decide to go for the Parting Shot. I did it actually going to go for that Sucker Punch, so that works out pretty nicely, and then Hamster's like, you cannot Sucker Punch me. I'm actually just going to head out of here. So I get that parting shot, which is great. Going to drop that physical attack. And the hamster gets tucked back for later, who doesn't have to come in on Stealth Rocks because he got rid of it himself. And the potential to still do some more stuff in this game, which is fantastic. So we know that this thing's plan is just to go for Sucker Punches. It probably has access to Spore. And I'm thinking this seems like a pretty good opportunity just to go into the Lycan Rock. I, I'm not necessarily super worried if this thing does go down. And I can just go for a super effective close combat here, thinking maybe I can grab a kill. I also know that I can take a Sucker Punch thanks to the Parting Shot, which is amazing. And then I just beat the hell out of the Mushroom. Expected that to kill, and it actually lives on like 5 HP. So, I swear, these things always just seem to live literally everything. I don't know what the hell their deal is. But after some poison damage, I know that I died with Sucker Punch. But what saves me from that is some priority in the form of Accelerock, which is actually good for a few reasons. So first of all, it kills that thing, which is nice. Don't have to worry about sucker punches, but also after this poison damage, I'm going to be knocked down to five HP. And I know that their final Pokemon being Corviknight, I'm going to be faster. And then I should be able to get off an Endeavor, effectively making this thing worthless. So it comes in, takes a little bit of stealth rock. And at this point, Endeavor is looking extremely juicy to click. And I'm like, oh, hell yeah. I kind of thought I wasn't going to be able to do it this time. And as it turns out, I'm not going to be able to do it because the freaking Corviknight's going to run because he's literally afraid of the dog. And uh, we got three people to run away from the Morpeko today, and that's just a testament to how scary this hamster is.
So that is going to do it for today's video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Having a lot of fun just making random teams and just trying to see what ends up working. And Warpeko is just a fun little dude. So if you did enjoy, remember to hit that like button. Leave a comment because I do love reading all of the comments. I literally read every single one of them. And you guys are awesome. And uh, I will catch you next time. Peace out.